You are watching Life on Gabriela TV, community television for you, by you. There is a transformative power of working from your place. So when we look at the North American continent, we say, so every place can contribute to this process. Where are we on this map? Right there. You are here. We're in a very specific place. So if we look at this place more closely, here we are on Gabriel Island, and you might notice that this island has a shape to it, that it's embedded in a larger landscape, and that there are already complex organizing patterns that exist in the geography of this place. And if you zoom out further and go, wow, look at all that structure, look at all those landscapes, look at all those patterns that we could work with to restore the health and the vitality to this place. start by saying thank you so much for inviting us into your community. I'm actually here with a team that includes Claire Atwell down here in the front, uh, Brandon Letzinger in the back. They're actually going to share a little bit at the end of this presentation. My partner Penny Hypo is back there in the corner and she and I are co-founders of the Design School for Regenerating Earth with a third partner named Benji. And then Stephen Morris who's here handling the AV and tech and he's recording and live streaming all of the talks that we're giving this month because we are building up a story and we're actually documenting it as it unfolds and sharing it, as you'll see in part of my presentation, sharing it with other bioregions around the world so that we can build up a planetary network of bioregions and that we can actually organize ourselves that really needs to be done. Now, I want to start by saying a little bit about why I'm standing in front of you. Like, who is this guy? Like, why is he here? And I could talk about my credentials and say, yeah, I was at university for a bunch of years. I have letters behind my name and several degrees, and I've studied lots of stuff. And that would be, like, stuffy and boring <laughs> and not really relevant. Because while, yes, I did learn earth system science at university, I did study cognitive science and cultural evolution and other things that are useful for the work we're doing, I really only have one claim for any kind of legitimacy to stand here tonight, and that is that I am a father. I'm a father. I have a daughter who's about to turn seven years old. Her name is Elise. She's absolutely beautiful. I get to go hiking with her in Old Growth Forest tomorrow. I'm excited about that. And the reason I feel like my only claim to legitimacy is being a father is because as we're going to review briefly in the beginning of this presentation, we're actually in a really dire, grave, serious situation where the future is pretty scary. And so I like to say that I chose to bring a child into the world with eyes wide open, fully aware that I was going to place my daughter in harm's way, that I was going to place her into a dangerous time of human existence as part of the planet. And I felt the best way that I could really believe in and invest in a future of humanity is to put some skin in the game. So I have the skin wrapped around my daughter's body is the skin I'm putting into the game. We need to build a world for the children that are going to grow up into very dangerous, very serious times. And so that is my claim to legitimacy for being here tonight. Now, I've also studied cognitive linguistics, and you might have heard of a guy named George Lakoff. He's one of my mentors, and I used to do work applying cognitive science to help social movements. So I'm really interested in language, which means I care about the words I use. So I want to actually explain my title. Because you can see the words here. Notice it doesn't say, do we regenerate 
Cascadia, as if we should or we shouldn't, I'm actually presuming that we should and that we must. The question is, how? How do we bring about regeneration, the restoration of life systems at the scale of something so massively large? I mean, look, this is a map of Cascadia that runs from southern Alaska to northern California, from the coast all the way to part of Wyoming, as defined by the watersheds of the Salish Sea and the Columbia River Basin. It's massive. Why would anyone say we need to do work at this scale? It's huge. And I think you're going to see, and what I'm going to share with you, that this is the minimum scale that we must be organizing at. We must be organizing at very large scales. So that question, how, becomes really, really important. So I also want to mention the word regenerate, because regenerate comes from the word regeneration. And this is a word that is currently being very thoroughly and very effectively greenwashed. If you don't believe me, the strongest advocate of regenerative agriculture in the world is Bill Gates. They're greenwashing these words like crazy, trying to make them meaningless and useless like they did for environmentalism, like they did for sustainability. But we can inoculate ourselves against this by simply knowing what regeneration is. Because then who cares what word we use? They can take the word and make it completely meaningless, but if you understand what it means, it's not going to matter. Regeneration is the dynamic pattern of every living being. Regeneration is the pattern of moment to moment reproducing the conditions of being alive. For example, if you look at the skin on my arm, you're going to see every bit of the skin is dead because there's subcutaneous fatty tissue that pushes outward to make these flakes that fall off. And every 30 days, my body completely regenerates my skin. Regeneration is the pattern of reproducing the conditions conducive to life moment to moment continually as long as life occurs. And so the regeneration of Cascadia is to work with the living patterns of watersheds, of mountain ranges, of marine ecosystems, of large-scale precipitation patterns to restore the whole vibrant health and well-being of our living systems, which is why you can't greenwash that away. And so I want to talk about how we do regeneration at this large scale and why we must do it. To start this conversation, I want to make a point that many, many others have made before. But it's a point that really sets the context, which is that if you look at the Earth from space, you'll notice a complete absence of boundaries. There are no nation states. There are no jurisdictions. Right? There are no municipal borders. They simply don't exist. They're fictions created by the human mind. What you do see is a completely holistic and integrated system. Just look at the water. If I asked you, where is the water in this image, you could see that it's in the ocean. And if you look on land, you'll see that there are rivers and lakes. If you look in the atmosphere, you'll see it in the clouds. But even in the places where there are no clouds, there's water vapor. So the better question would be, in this image, can you find a single pixel where there is not water? And the answer is no. The water completely integrates this image. In fact, with subduction zones where ocean seafloors go below continental plates, water is carried down into the Earth's magma and is pushed up through volcanoes as steam back into the air. The water is even inside the Earth. It integrates all life on the planet. And this interdependence and this integration brings with it profound systemic risk. And what we have to deal with is the systemic risk that comes when we destabilize these relationships. For us to talk about why we need to do regeneration at large scales, I want to give us a little bit of a shared context of why we need to do this and where we are now. So just a quick question, show of hands, who here in this room has heard of the planetary boundaries? Wow, so maybe about a quarter of you. 
So the planetary boundaries are the answer to a very, very interesting question. This is a framework developed by the Stockholm Resilience Center, which is a collaboration of about 3,500 scientists who study the dynamic Earth. And back in 2009, they asked a very interesting question. The question was this. With everything we know about the dynamic Earth, are there any boundaries or thresholds that if we crossed it, we would leave the safe operating space for humanity to have agriculture, to have population centers, to have empires or civilizations or global supply chains? Are there any boundaries or thresholds that if we crossed even one, we would leave this safe space? And then they gathered the researchers and did the research and they found, oh, there are nine planetary boundaries. Nine. And here they are. Climate change is one of them. We talk a lot about climate change, but it's only one. Then there's biosphere integrity. Biosphere integrity is the rate of extinction that prunes away the resilience of ecosystems until they collapse. This is the measure of the mass extinction event. Then there's the land system change, which is taking healthy ecosystems and degrading them, cutting down forest, desertification, <coughs> creation of agriculture, creating urban landscapes, all of which are degraded landscapes. So land system change is another one. Then there's fresh water use. Because only 1% of all the water in the world is fresh water. 99% is salt water. So that fresh water needs to be uncontaminated and to flow and circulate for all of the life. Then there's biogeochemical flows, which is chemically reactive nitrogen and phosphorus used in synthetic fertilizers in industrial agriculture. That when it runs off of our land into our rivers and goes out into the sea, it creates massive apoxic zones, which are zones without any oxygen, which can destabilize and collapse the basis of the food chain in the world's ocean. Then there's ocean acidification. Well, if you make the ocean too acidic, then you begin to dissolve calcium carbonate which is the body of mollusks and shelled organisms in the world ocean. Then there's atmospheric aerosol loading, which is a fancy word for air pollution. Too much air pollution, we won't be able to survive. And then there's stratospheric ozone depletion, because in the stratosphere there's an ozone layer that absorbs the ultraviolet radiation, and if that radiation got to the surface, there'd be no life on land for any of our continents. So we need this stratospheric ozone layer. And then there's a ninth one called novel entities, which is any chemical created by humans that the planet can't deal with. So you see there are nine. We talk a lot about climate change, but look at them. There are nine of them. So if there are nine and we cross even one, we leave the safe space for humanity. There's a natural follow-up question, right? How are we doing? Right? So they went and did the research, held the conferences, published the papers. In 2015, they said, oh, we crossed four. We've crossed the planetary boundaries for climate change, for the rate of extinction, for land system change, which is the destruction of ecosystems, and for these reactive nitrogen and phosphorus from industrial agriculture. But then the research continued. They gathered more data. And in 2021, they said, oh, we have to add freshwater use and ocean acidification. Now, we didn't cross the boundary during that time. It's just that that's when the research was clear enough that they could definitively say we'd crossed it. And then in 2022, they added novel entities, microplastics, long-lived synthetic polymers that exist in every drop of breast milk of every woman on Earth, in every aquifer, in every body of water on the entire planet. You can even find them in clouds above the mountains. They're ubiquitous. And so we've crossed seven of nine planetary boundaries. So when someone says, we have until 2030 to avoid abrupt climate change. It's a lie. It's just a flat out distraction. Trying to reduce the whole conversation to the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When the reality is we are in the midst of completely destabilizing the planet's ability to regulate itself. The lesson we should take from this image is that the only way for humans to restore harmony and safety for our future is to completely reimagine the human presence as part of the Earth. Nothing less will do. So notice that 
this graphic says we're not going to get our way out by changing our light bulbs. We're not going to get out by, by replacing the engine and our internal combustion engines of single occupancy vehicles with electric batteries mm -hmm. for our single occupancy vehicles, especially since those batteries require us to scrape the sea floor and tear off the tops of mountains to get all the lithium. And we call that clean energy. No green consumer product choice is going to get us out of this. This requires us to reimagine the human presence as part of the Earth. So how does this work? How do these planetary boundaries work? This is a summary of the tipping points of the Earth system. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I just want to show you a few. Because crossing planetary boundaries means we cause these to break down. So look, there's the Greenland ice sheet. If you melt the Greenland ice sheet due to global warming, you cause sea level rise. But if the ice sheet melts too quickly, it dumps a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic, disrupts the mixing process, and shuts down the great conveyor belt of the world ocean. If you have too much deforestation in the Amazon rainforest, it makes a transition to grassland savanna, releasing huge amounts of carbon dioxide. I don't know if you know this, but the Amazon rainforest has been a carbon emitter since 2016. It actually releases more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than it absorbs due to deforestation. If the West Antarctic ice sheet were to fall off into the ocean, sea level would rise by four to five meters. The boreal forest, the world's largest forest, if it dies back, will cause a huge release of greenhouse gases. Now, did anyone notice the pattern of wildfires in, in Canada this year? The boreal forest is starting to die back. So the interesting thing is with all of these tipping points, and I didn't even name them all, if you cross one, you make it more likely to cross others. And you can see that there are interdependent relationships across different parts of the planet. Let's look at an example of this. This is a simple feedback loop for the loss of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere's summer. It works like this. If you have global warming, it causes the warming to be amplified in the Arctic. It's a lot hotter in the Arctic than at the equator, which means the change in temperature is bigger, which means there's a reduction of Arctic sea ice. But sea ice is white. It reflects 90% of sunlight back into space. If you replace sea ice with dark blue ocean, then it absorbs 90% of sunlight into the ocean. Less sunlight's reflected from the surface. The ocean absorbs heat. This causes the atmosphere to heat more, and the cycle repeats. This is a positive feedback loop, an accelerating process. So the question is, what happens when there's no longer ice in the Arctic Ocean in the Northern Hemisphere's summer, what's called the Blue Ocean Event. What happens? Well, we can actually see it here, because this is a map of the jet streams. See this pattern that's shaped like the capital letter Omega? That's what makes it rain in this part of the world during the winter. So if we have a collapse of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean, and a change in the temperature distributions, our jet streams become really chaotic and erratic, and we lose the stability of our weather patterns across the whole planet. And this characteristic pattern of winter precipitation in northwestern part of North America could go away. So this is how changes in one part of the planet can have cascading effects to changes in another part of the planet. So said another way, the Earth is a whole system. It's got cascading relationships where you can have changes that spread from one place to another, and you can have significant time delays where you can make changes in one part of the Earth, but you don't see the effects until decades later. Which means the breakdown of stability unfolds across space and time. But there's a key word here, across. Because there's a silver lining in this message. See, across says that you have changes across multiple locations of the Earth at the same time. Changes in one place cause changes in another place. And so the silver lining of this message is that the same interdependencies that create this systemic risk 
are the relationships that can build up systemic resilience. I mean, just look at how much we know about the earth, how much we've learned in the last couple of decades, how much more we know in the details of where the breakdown occurs and where the changes are expressed which means we can start to look at those relationships and try to restore the stability, but it cannot be done in one place alone because the changes cascade across multiple places simultaneously. So I've traveled all over the world, visited lots of regenerative projects, and I've noticed something. All of them are bounded by the edges of the plot of land where the project occurs. So you can have a great regenerative farm, a great permaculture project, a great reforestation effort, a really nice riparian restoration of the side of a stream. And they're always bounded by the plot of land. But let's say you have a great permaculture project in a watershed and someone upstream from you dumps chemicals into it. They flow across your land because every plot of land is embedded within a larger set of ecological connections. So just like the watershed and the movement of water is an ecological connection, that the, the scale of regeneration being limited by the plot of land means we can't really create transformative change. But there's a really beautiful thing that's, that those ecological connections are already organized into larger holistic landscapes. Things like watersheds, coastal estuaries, islands, mountain chains, or monsoon, or other kinds of precipitation patterns. And those holistic landscapes are embedded in larger planetary processes. So when I look at these four levels and I ask myself, where is the pathway to planetary sustainability? And I find it doesn't actually exist in any of them. You can't find the solution in any of these levels. But if you change your perspective and look across the levels, you see that by working across multiple levels at the same time, you can actually restore the stability of the planet and there's a pathway forward. How does it work? Well, let's say you've got that regenerative farm on a plot of land and it's in a watershed. What if there are multiple regenerative projects in that watershed and there are ecological connections between them? you can actually coordinate, coordinate multiple regenerative projects through their ecological connections organized at the scale of entire landscapes. And by doing this, you can regenerate entire landscapes. And if you do this in multiple locations, you begin to stabilize planetary processes. So the secret behind all of this is a statement that is deceptively simple but profound in its implications. It is this. Everything that happens anywhere on Earth happens somewhere. Sounds so simple, right? So simple. But if there are all these interdependencies between all the different parts of the Earth and everything is connected, that means every place is connected to every other place through relationships that we can learn and understand. There is a transformative power of working from your place. So when we look at the North American continent, and we say, so every place can contribute to this process. Where are we on this map? Right there. You are here. We're in a very specific place. So if we look at this place more closely, here we are on Gabriel Island, and you might notice that this island has a shape to it, that it's embedded in a larger landscape, that there are already complex organizing patterns that exist in the geography of this place. And if you zoom out further and go, wow, look at all that structure, look at all those landscapes, look at all those patterns that we could work with to restore the health and the vitality to this place. You see, all of this structure is what allows us to hold the complexity of the regenerative process at large scales. Let me show you how that works. Every piece of land, every place on Earth has a unique geologic history. This place has a unique geologic history, like no other place on Earth. Every place on Earth has a unique ecological history. 
the kind of life that exists there, the kinds of ecosystems that are there. And every place, if humans have lived in that place, has a unique cultural history. And when you start to put these together, how do the rocks and the geology and the landscapes, how do they form? What kinds of life and life systems exist here? What kinds of humans lived in this place and had sustainable, harmonious relationships with this place? And as you start to build up this understanding, you create a profound and unique story of that place. And as you start to put all of this knowledge together, you gain whole system understandings of your place. This is a place formed by this kind of tectonic plates with these kinds of erosion patterns. Here, for example, in the Salish Sea with all of the fjords from the ice sheets and the glaciers, something you won't find in the tropics. And so there's a unique geologic history, a unique ecological history, and a unique cultural history that tells you how life works in this place. And all of that knowledge is in the place itself. Now here's what's beautiful about this. If you enter into a place and construct its story, you'll very quickly notice that the story isn't over. It's still happening. You enter into an unfolding story of place. Or if you wanted to make it a verb, you could participate in the story-ing of place. So you arrive into a place and you begin to learn how does this place work? How does thriving and flourishing, health and well-being, how does that work in this place? And with these whole system understandings, the people who live in the place can begin to imagine regenerative futures. An example, here's a river that used to have salmon. How do we know that? We've constructed its history. What would it mean to regenerate this place? Maybe we should restore the salmon to this river. And you can start to imagine regenerative futures that are unique to the place. See, there's transformational power in place because it holds so much information that is available to us. I'll give an example. This is an image I took from Google Earth. That's Eugene, Oregon. Just for perspective, that way is north. And if you look at this image and I ask you, where are the most degraded places in this image? So I've got a daughter who's almost seven years old. She's quite the artist. If I gave her a couple of crayons and said, draw in the most degraded places, she'd probably draw something like this. It's like, there you go, daddy. It's those. Because you can see it. It's in the valleys. It's in the watersheds where they have deforested them to put in agriculture. It's in the confluence of the rivers, because Eugene is at the confluence of the McKinsey River and the Willamette River. And the confluence is this floodplain, this alluvial floodplain, and that's the degraded landscape. So when you look at this and ask, how would we regenerate this, the shape of the land tells you how. Anyone who's done watershed restoration knows you start at the top of the watershed and you work your way down, helping the water to flow across the land. Now I want you to notice this one right here. This is a nice valley. I want you to notice the size of it. Because the size of this is maybe about 15 to 20 kilometers long, by maybe six or seven kilometers across. There might be a hundred pieces of private land. This is a human scale that you could organize around. You could walk from one end to another in a day. You could drive across it and visit multiple sites in a day. You could go and visit every landowner in this place and start to explore the future of this place. And you could begin to design a process to regenerate that entire watershed. You'd look for ecological connectivity, the movements of water, the reforestation, the health of the streams. This is a human scale of organizing. This could be done. It's easy to imagine. And notice there are three of them in this image. So what's interesting about this is if we go out to a larger scale, now I've turned the map around and this way is north, because this is the Willamette Valley in Western Oregon, which means Portland's to the north, Eugene is to the south. The distance from one end to the other is maybe about 160, 170 kilometers. From east to west is maybe about 60 or 70 kilometers. This is a pretty big land area. How would you ever regenerate that? Well, the answer is, Look for the most degraded places, grab your crayon, 
I'll color a couple of them in for you. Once again, it's the valleys and the watersheds. You can begin to organize around this. And while I didn't color them all in, if you add them up, there might be 30, there might be 40. Each one of them is a human scale of management. And now you can see how you could begin to regenerate the entire Willamette Valley of Western Oregon. Now what's interesting is when I go to a larger scale, here's the Columbia River Basin with 174 rivers draining into the Columbia River Basin. It's 258,000 square miles. Is that like 500,000 square kilometers? Frickin' huge. It's the same size as the drainage of the Colorado River Basin. It's monumental. How would you ever regenerate that? But look, there's the Willamette Valley. And now you can see the pattern. I'll just go back and show it. Local places you organize around the contours of the land, human scale projects. Larger scale, you just do more of them in parallel. Larger scale, you just do this and repeat it across the entire basin. And you see how you could regenerate the entire Columbia River Basin. See, what we have here is a way of thinking about how to regenerate the entire Cascadia bioregion. Because notice this. This blue area is the Columbia River Basin. This yellow area is the Fraser. You have all these other drainages around the Salish Sea. And you see they're all organized as watersheds. This is a powerful way to organize our local landscapes. And what we can do is begin to imagine a mycelial web of regenerative projects organizing around local landscapes that spreads across all of Cascadia. So as we're traveling through Cascadia, having these conversations, you can imagine every place we go has local organizing teams and they start to organize around the regeneration of their landscapes. Now this is so cool and so awesome. Folks down on the Snake River, they get the idea, they start to do it too. And now you can see a web of regenerative work organized around landscapes that could regenerate all of Cascadia on this massive scale. And so to do this work, we can see that the land shows us how to organize, but how do the humans organize themselves? What are the structures of collaboration for humans to do bioregional scale regenerative work? How does that work? Well, once again, we organize ourselves by the land. We look at the shapes of the land, and then we create bioregional learning centers, which is we create ways of educating to create that story of place and those whole system understandings of place. But of course, we're going to need territorial governance because we're going to need the ability to set priorities, to identify needs, to mobilize resources. So we have to create local governing capacities. And we do this by identifying local regenerative projects and weaving them into tapestries as landscapes and identifying local education processes and weaving them into ecosystems of learning. Let me show you how this works. To do this, you might have noticed, this implies a lot of cooperation. So we have to design pro-social contexts, which is to say, we need to create shared identity and purpose. For example, do we want salmon in this river? That's a shared purpose. The shared identity is everyone who wants that. And then together, you have to create fair and inclusive decision-making, fast and fair con uh, conflict resolution. If there are multiple groups, you need to create collaborative relationships between the groups. These things that give you the ability to work together. So we have to design that for every scale of the work. But we can do this when we understand what is this idea of a bioregion? Because you know, I've been using the word the whole time, but I never actually defined it. So let me define it really quickly so we have a shared understanding. Bioregion is just short for biological region, right? And so biological region is the geography, the spatial range in which all aspects of life can be found for any organism. It's the entire life context for any biological organism. I'll give an example. Starfish. What is the bioregion for starfish? They have a geographic range that they exist within and it's called the intertidal zone, right? You go to a coastline, and between high tide and low tide is everything that the starfish need for food, a place for shelter, to be able to reproduce themselves. The entire population of starfish can live within the, the bioregion of its intertidal zone. 
every living organism has a bioregion. Bees have a bioregion. Oak trees have a bioregion. Humans have a bioregion. Humans have a scale at which you can find the entire life context of the human culture and economy. Now, the interesting thing is for humans, this gets a lot more complicated because they can vary depending on human culture, depending on worldview or cosmovision, the model of the economic system, right? The, the way that they organize trade and exchange, the kind of technology they have. So human bioregions are more complex, but still, they can organize themselves around a geographic range that is coherent to itself. And so a bioregion, by definition, is the scale at which the whole life system works, which means every bioregion, by definition, is its own model for regeneration. Because every dynamic pattern you need to have for the life and well-being of that population is, by definition, within the whole life context and it's the bioregion, which means we have to reimagine the human presence on Earth as a planetary network of bioregions and creating learning exchanges between these bioregions so that we can learn how to regenerate them as quickly as possible. This is what needs to happen. In every place on Earth, we need to recreate the conditions for living locally in terms of material flows, Integrated life systems, which means the relationship between humans and the rest of life, and the thriving of families and communities. We need to create local living economies. Now, what this map shows, these are different ecozones, which means you take the kind of geology, the kinds of soils, the kinds of climate, the kinds of ecosystems, and it defines an ecozone. And you see the colors represent different ecozones. Now, it doesn't matter what the colors represent for our purposes here. What matters is that there's more than one, which means we should expect there to be a diversity of human cultures and a diversity of human economies, each one adapted to its own ecozone, to its own place. So this isn't a new idea. Some of you may be old enough to remember a very controversial study that came out in 1972. It was the very first computer simulation of the global economy and they created a scenario called business as usual. That's where that phrase comes from. And in business as usual, they showed the human population peaking around 2040 and then rapidly collapsing. The study was called limits to growth. Now, unfortunately, that scenario, which was not a forecast, has tracked reality almost perfectly between then and now. We are tracking business as usual. And so this controversial study created a lot of debate. So between 1972 and about 1983, the best minds in the world who were concerned about this started gathering at different places to try to figure out how to get to planetary sustainability, how to live within planetary limits. They had their first meeting at Lake Balaton in Hungary, so they called themselves the Balaton Group. And so after 10 years, this Balaton Group, the lead author of Limits to Growth, Donella Meadows, wrote an essay called A Brief History of the Balaton Group, and she published it in 1983. And in that essay, this is one of the quotes. Vernon Rutten, who is a member of the Balaton Group, said this, each agroeconomic region is so unique that the concept of transfer of technology is irrelevant. What's relevant is the transfer of the capacity to develop technology and institutions that are consistent with the cultural endowment and resource endowment of each region. We need to create unique institutions and unique capacities to govern for each place. And then Dana Meadows went on to say, out of this 10 years of meetings and conversations came a vision of a number of centers where information and models about resources and the environment are housed. There would need to be many of these centers all over the world, each one responsible for a distinct bioregion. So in 1983, the best thinkers in the world, after spending 10 years, came up with this pathway to planetary sustainability. They said, we need to create local living economies organized as bioregions. Those, bio, those bioregions need to each have their own bioregional learning center, and they need to learn how to coordinate this across the planet. So in 1983, I was six years old. That was 40 years ago. 
Has anyone come up with a better way to get to planetary uh, sustainability since 1983? No. No. This is the only way. It just is so coherent. It makes so much sense. So 40 years ago, we actually had the pathway to planetary sustainability. And many, many people on our journey through Cascadia were there and have been part of this and remember this. Some of you in this room may remember this. So for 40 years, we have had the knowledge. The idea has existed. And we went off into technocratic reductionistic solutions, measuring the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and ignoring the planet as a holistic system, creating a completely dysfunctional environmental discourse. When this is what we've needed to do all along. I want to show an example of how this works in a different context so you can see how you might apply it here. Because I've been living in Colombia, building a bioregional pattern of regeneration with a lot of local people. This is a topographic map of the northern Andes in Colombia. And this region is the region that we're trying to regenerate. It's about 500,000 hectares of land, and it defines a unique regional climatic system. Because on the west is a tall mountain range, which creates a damming effect so that the, there's a cloud forest there and the moisture has to go around, but then it bumps up against these other mountains and inside this area is a coherent circulation of weather that creates a well-defined local climate system. Inside this area is a unique ecosystem like no other on Earth. It's called the High Andes Tropical Dry Forest. 80% endemic species. Eight out of 10 species exist nowhere else on Earth. More than 95% deforested for monoculture agriculture and rapidly becoming a desert. So when I moved there in November of 2019, I stood in this place and I looked, there's Barichara, the town where I live. Its tourism slogan is the prettiest town in Colombia, which is probably true because it's absolutely gorgeous there. And this area in the foreground is called Bioparque Moncora, which is a community reforestation project started in 2009. Everything in this foreground looked like this, bare clay and rock in 2009. And they're growing a forest there. And so when I stood there, I saw clouds all around and blue sky overhead because the deforestation of the plateau in the center created something called the heat island effect which pushes the moisture away, which accelerates de desertification. And I immediately saw that we needed to connect the forest across the land to restore the hydrological cycle and reverse the desertification and restore the regional climate system. But being an outsider meant that I didn't really know what was going on, so I did the permaculture thing. What is that? You show up, you observe, and you don't do anything. And you watch and see what the local patterns are. And what I saw was that there were lots of really beautiful projects, but they were completely isolated and fragmented from each other. So in the first year, I identified 15 of these projects with a track record of success. I did crowdfunding to raise some money. I did the really awesome thing a gringo from the North could do, which is I gave them a risk and a fear. And I said, hi, I'm a white guy from the North. I'm coming with money. Would you guys figure out how to use this so I don't screw it up? They loved this. And so we had 15 local projects with local leaders, and they created their own framework for how to collaborate and spend the money. And they started weaving a tapestry of their own projects. And we started a design school for healing the entire landscape to connect these projects with each other. We did this with four patterns that operate at a territorial scale. One of them, is the restoration of entire watersheds. Because in Barichara, all of the rivers are dead. They're dead. Either no water runs in them at all, and when it rains, it just runs down the hill and dumps into the, the canyon below, or the water that's there is so contaminated that nothing can live in it. This is actually typical of Latin America and most of Africa, and honestly, most of the world. This is where our affluence and wealth comes from, is extracting it from all these people. And so we're in a place where all the rivers are dead, which means we need to organize around creating watershed councils. We need to organize reforestation along watersheds, doing soil building and building forests to restore the life to rivers. So one of our patterns is to organize around watersheds. 
Another pattern is that we created a learning center in Centropic Agroforestry, which is a reforestation approach that is the fastest way to create mature forest. It allows you to create a forest that grows food, medicinal plants, textiles, natural fibers, and construction materials, the basis of the material flows of a local economy. So when we started bringing in teachers of Centropic Agroforestry, we had the participants of the workshops create demonstration sites that are community projects. And many of them were private landowners, so they started applying these techniques on their land. So we do technical field site visits and bring all of the participants to everyone's land and create learning exchanges across the territory. So we use this model of creating an economy based on forest with reforestation together with the tapestry of relationships among the participants. Which means we started working on the transformation of local food systems. And Barichara were really lucky because if you go 10 kilometers away from the town in every direction, you'll find that we grow 70% of our food, which is amazing because most places are less than 3%. And with all the deforestation, if we reforest it with agroforestry systems, we could probably get to 100%. Now, Barichara has got 6,000 people. I heard there are about 4,500 people here on the island. Interesting parallel that we could actually move toward food shed security in the tropics with agroforestry systems by working on the transformation of local food systems. And then we work on the design of alternative economic models based on solidarity and trust. We help build a community store where 80 local, local producers come together and sell their products. These are food, these are cosmetics, these are tinctures and medicinal <laughs> products. These are various things that they sell to the tourism market, but they also exchange with each other. And we've been experimenting with creating a community currency, with time banking, with various things connected to a local economy of exchange. And with these four patterns, we are weaving together the local projects across the entire territory. One thing I want to say that's really important is that all regenerative work in one way or another is about learning. So everything involves education. So in Bari Chara, we're doing education in a different way to help weave us together. This is a story of the man there on the goatee, his name's Felipe, who decided that he was going to help the children restore rivers. So he started this activity called Caminatas del Agua, the water walks, where children between the age of four and 10 years old would walk through the dead stream beds. They'd get permission from the owners of the land to cross their land, and the children would interview the adults. And the children would ask, what happened to the water? And because Colombia has a history of violence, the adults would say in Spanish, que pena, which is, what a shame. We were fighting with each other, we were killing each other, and the water went away, which is what happened. And this cracks open the hearts of the adults, and it replants their conscience for the water. And the children are the teachers. And as the children start talking about restoring the watersheds, we have different kinds of watershed restoration expertise that comes to help them. We have indigenous leaders like this man from the Muisca culture who comes and gives them guidance and affirmation to help the children lead the way in restoring the rivers. Now what's interesting about this is that when you ask kids, how do you restore a dead river? And you have these kids come together, they have ideas. This little girl's named Quetzal. In this picture, she's six years old. And she's holding up the list of ideas for restoring the Barichara River. Now, you can't read them, but my favorite one of the ideas that she came up with was, what if we take like hay bales and we tie them together, we put mushrooms in them, and we put them in the river, and it can collect all the contaminants? Because <laughs> she likes to watch YouTube with her dad, and she'd learned about microremediation. So the beautiful thing is the kids have great ideas. What they need is for the adults to take them seriously and the children lead the way. So this is one of the things we do in Barichara. Another thing we do is, is evident in this other image. This is Gabriella and her granddaughter, Soraya. We have a practice in Barichara, which is when the adults are having important conversations, as often as possible, we have the children play in the center of the circle. Why? Because we want the children to remember what the adults were talking about when they grow up. And we want the adults 
to remember who they're making decisions for to hold the integrity of all of their decisions. So we place the children in the middle of our most important decisions. This changes everything. It changes absolutely everything. So, you know, I said when I arrived, all the projects were isolated from each other. This is Beale Park Amoncora, that community reforestation project. Right next to it, a five minute walk away on a hiking trail, is Fundacion Monte Chico, where they teach children traditional practices in bioconstruction, natural fibers, and textiles from native plants. These two projects, when I arrived, did not know about each other and were not working together. Sometimes it takes an outsider to come in and see what exists in the community and bring it together. So if I take projects like these, now you can't read them. If I put them up on the wall and go, oh look, here's Kene Colibri, which is a community theater where the children learn indigenous mythologies and storytelling to help them connect with the land, or Corasoma, which is helping women form healing circles for domestic violence and cultural trauma, or Agua Santa, which is a regenerative farm doing agroforestry and watershed restoration. So there's a diversity of projects. And when you look at them like this, you're like, those are all cool projects, but how do they relate to each other? Which ones should be working together? And it's just not obvious. What should give, be given priority? But when you look at them like this, it shifts the whole perspective because that community theater is here and that regenerative farm is there and they're in the same watershed. And now you see that you can organize the community theater and the children who live in those, in those campus you know, country schools to organize around the regeneration of the watershed, including visiting the regenerative farm that's in the same watershed. And the land shows us how to organize ourselves through the existing connections of the land. And then we know how to prioritize and organize our work. And so this leads to bioregional learning centers. What are they and how are they different from other kinds of education? Well, one thing is, remember, this is learning how to live in your place. So one of the things a bioregional learning center should do is it should coordinate the existing learning processes, help bring them together to form tapestries of learning. What are all of the ways you learn about this place? Do you have people that do nature walks and identify plants or mushrooms? Do you have people that teach children about nature connection? Do you have aquatic ecology experts that can do watershed restoration? What are all of the ways that you learn about your place? The Bioregional Learning Center creates coordination among them. This means they do a lot of mapping and knowledge sharing. They gather the knowledge and make it coherent. So what are all the ways you learn about the rivers here? What are the appropriate plants to plant in which context? How do you build your soils? What are the indigenous practices here? Who are the people that know them? How should those be brought in? What's the appropriate way? What is the role of ceremony? What is the role of music and the arts? You're mapping and sharing knowledge through bioregional learning centers. This creates a gateway into community activities. So let's say you enter the community and you say, I really care about trauma healing in the community. Oh, you should talk to this group. I really care about reforestation and I love trees. Oh, you should talk to this group. It gives you a way to navigate and find your way to be of service in the community. This is true for outsiders of the community, but also people who live here. You say, oh, I want to get involved. I can go to the Bioregional Learning Center and find my way to the projects and activities because it is being coordinated by the Bioregional Learning Center. This includes advanced modeling and simulation like we find at our best advanced research labs. I happen to have noticed that you all live in a place that is waiting for a really big earthquake. <laughs> Wouldn't you like to have computational facilities running simulations of the tsunami risk, which is part of the story of this place, you see this advanced computational modeling, the best of science and technology, is part of bioregional learning centers. But it needs to be balanced by indigenous perspectives and decolonization, the decolonization of education. Because science is really helpful for knowing what works, knowing how to do things, but it completely lacks ethical frameworks. Completely lacks them. 
whereas indigenous perspectives evolved in landscapes to create sustained, lasting, right relationships to place. When I talk to my friends who are indigenous leaders about this kind of work, they all agree we need the best of science to help us with what we're doing. We need it. But it needs to be in harmony and integration and right relationship with indigenous knowledge. And this is something bioregional learning centers can help us to create. Notice that bioregional learning centers are both centralized and decentralized. Centralizing components of coordination and knowledge sharing and mapping so that decentralized efforts can have autonomy but also be coherent with each other. This is what a bioregional learning center does. Now, how do we create the structures of territorial governance? Well, we begin by mapping and weaving local projects. How does this lead to governance? Well, how do you map local projects? You gather the people who are leading them, you convene them together, and you talk about their projects, which means those people who have deep knowledge about their projects can begin to identify shared needs and priorities across their projects. They can set heuristics for decision making, which is the beginning of governance. As they identify their needs, they can form landscape partnerships to say, well, if we're going to address these needs, we have to work together. For example, if you want to restore salmon to a river, you might want some fish experts. You might want to talk with farmers. You might want to talk with people who do education. You start to gather multi-stakeholder groups who form partnerships around the land, which is a form of governance that begins to take hold. As you form landscape partnerships, you very quickly realize you need to create community funding structures. Because the only people who know how to allocate funding are the people who know the projects and have local knowledge. So they have to actually create their own decisions together in a collaborative way to allocate resources. This is the only way to mobilize resources and service to the whole landscape instead of what normally happens, which is each project competing with the others for scarce resources. Without this framework of collaboration and integration, they can't come together in service to a whole watershed or estuary or island or any other large scale system. But as they do this, notice what happens. They begin to cultivate local sovereignty. The sovereignty does not exist until there's the capacity to enact power locally. The sovereignty is created through this process. And notice how sovereignty is the ability to direct our resources toward our shared goals locally, which is governance. And this creates much stronger collaboration internally and much stronger sovereign positions to negotiate relationships externally. And it's all born from the people and projects who care for this place. It is born from a love and stewardship of place and its diverse forms. This leads us to a framework that I'll talk about very briefly, but it's to say that you can actually mobilize large amounts of money around this. This is a framework developed by the Common Land Foundation, which is a foundation based in Amsterdam, led by Willem Verwerda, who's a tropical ecologist. And at one time, he was the director of IUCN, which is the global organization for, for biodiversity conservation. And Willem noticed something in all of his years trying to protect landscapes. So you'd get these great projects, they'd be really well funded, and as soon as the funding ran out, you could just cue the chainsaws. You'd spend years protecting a place and you would watch it destroyed. He got tired of that. And he realized we have to stop funding projects and start funding processes. Processes that last for long periods of time. And so he developed a framework for convincing his, his rich friends, he's from the Netherlands, there's a lot of money there, he has a lot of rich friends. When he talked to his rich friends, they care about the environment, but they're basically ecological idiots. Bless their hearts, they did not understand ecology. He talked ecology, it was like, whew, right over their heads. So he's like, I have to find a language that my friends who have money know how to understand. So he said, oh, first of all, they know financial return. They got that one. Let's give them three more. In addition to financial return, let's do return on nature, which is benefits to, to life, to ecosystems and health. Return on 
social, which is social and economic benefits, and the fourth one, return on inspiration. Which one of those do you think is the most powerful? Inspiration, 10 to one, even financially. The powerful stories create coherence and engagement and it transforms the relationship. So they found these simple ways of talking and they said, has anyone ever mobilized hundreds of millions of dollars for a project that takes decades to enact? Has anyone ever done that? The answer is yes, all the time. They're called infrastructure projects. Like if you're gonna create a light rail system for a city, Brandon and I were talking about this, the third expansion of the light rail system around Seattle cost $58 billion. So humans actually know how to manage large scale projects that last for long periods of time. So Willem, being smart himself, said, I'm gonna take the model of infrastructure projects and translate the restoration of watersheds for my ecologically ignorant, but otherwise nice, rich friends. He said, well, if you're gonna do a large scale infrastructure project, you need a management team, right? You need a management team. They can do contracting, they can do legal work, they can do resourcing, like, and they maintain it for the whole lifetime of the project. So you need a core team that can manage the regeneration of your landscape. And he found that typically you need about $2 million per year to fund these landscape teams for at least 20 years. So do the math, 2 million times 20, $40 million just for the team that manages the process. But then they found to build a regenerative economy at this scale, you have to invest in what's called public goods infrastructure. Public goods infrastructure is what you create that benefits everyone. For example, it's kind of hard to have a knowledge economy without educated people, so education is a public good. And that's why we use taxpayer money to fund education to create educated populations. It's a public good. So the public goods of a regenerative economy is the infrastructure of the regenerative projects. Where would you go to learn how to build soil? Well, do you have regenerative projects so you can learn that? How would you create integrated supply chains? Like if you're gonna do massive reforestation, where do you get the seeds? Where do you build the soil? Where are your tree nurseries? And you start to see you need infrastructure. And they found that on average, you need about $5 million a year for these 100,000 hectare or larger landscapes to fund the integration of regenerative projects managed and coordinated by core teams. So again, do the math. 5 million per year, 20 years, $100 million. So we're talking about $150 million to regenerate entire watersheds. What's interesting in this model is that your regenerative businesses usually don't become profitable until about eight to 10 years in. Trying to create a regenerative business in an economy that's designed for extraction, it can't compete. And so a lot of people try to create regenerative businesses. By the way, this is sometimes called the valley of death by investors, because it's a place where you have to keep like giving money to keep the damn thing going so it just doesn't die, and it's eight to 10 years. And when you have regenerative businesses, they have a profit, you have a tax base, and then your local governments finally understand it and start supporting it. And this is a model that has now been tested in about 16 landscapes around the world. They're up to 25 they're working with, and they've been going since 2012, so they have a track record of success but I just wanted to show you that you can actually think at these large scales and mobilize significant amounts of resources in service to building regenerative economies. Which is why Donna and I are like, let's make this happen. Because we need to do this for restoring watersheds, for food sheds, for all the things that a lot of us here care about. Probably all of us here care about, hopefully. So what we need to do is create bioregional investment platforms. Which is if you imagine these holistic landscapes have multiple projects in them, if they start to collaborate together, just by default, you have a portfolio of projects. If you have people who want to invest money where they want to be sure the money makes an impact, so even if it's philanthropic money, if you have 20 projects, one of them fails, well, that's fine, 19 others succeeded, and the one that failed, you learned. And so that's a good investment, you've managed the risk. This way of organizing allows larger amounts of resources to flow into landscapes. And so, it works like this. You have bioregional learning centers that weave together and coordinate local learning processes. You have territorial governance created among those lo local projects to build community funding and governance structures. You begin to build up frameworks of integrated landscape management to manage the process of this landscape scale. And this creates a robust circulation of value and exchange among all of the projects. 
or said in a more human way, you weave the people in projects around their landscapes. This grows their ability to cooperate with each other, which deepens their ability to organize, and you birth regenerative economies at the scale of bioregions. This is how you do it. Remember I said when you talk about how, this is how you do it. And so if we look at the Salish Sea, isn't it interesting? It's organized already for you. It's organized as watersheds. Look at all those beautiful watersheds. And by the way, if you want examples of regenerative economies, notice where those watersheds are, and now look at this. These are the language families of First Nations peoples organized across their geography, and you'll notice that they roughly correspond to the watersheds. It's not perfect because they actually traded across watersheds, but a language family is what happens after long periods of economic and cultural exchange. You create shared language families. So this is a map of long-standing regenerative economies organized around watersheds and landscape systems. Which is to say, if you want to learn how to do this, guess who already knows how? All of these people. <laughs> and you start to see that there might be aligned interests and shared purpose between indigenous people and people who want to regenerate landscapes. Because we're talking about regenerating these landscapes right here. And so this reveals the method and the madness of our bioregional activation tour. We're doing this crazy rock band tour, 14 places in 30 days. So we started out in the Columbia River Gorge at the beginning of the month where we had exactly this conversation. We actually started at a very important place called Salilo Falls, which is a sacred site with 15,000 years of documented history of indigenous peoples gathering there for exchange that was drowned under a lake in the Columbia River when they, op when they closed the Dulles Dam in 1957. So we started our bioregional activation tour by hearing the story of the last living indigenous person of that place at the end and the completion of cultural genocide as she led us through a ritual of grieving to bless Salilo Falls, that Salilo Falls may one day be restored. And now we have a sense of what regeneration really means for Cascadia. So we started in the Columbia River Gorge, then we went to Eugene, Oregon, then to Portland, then we went to Olympia, then we went to Vashon Island, then to uh, Seattle, then to Whidbey Island, then we jumped across to Port Townsend, Victoria, here we are in Gabriola, after this we're going to Bellingham and Skagit, and then back to Seattle. And in 30 days, we're creating exactly the same conversation in every one of these places. What's beautiful about this is the organization of this is local. Donna and a local team organized this event for us to come here tonight, which means we have 14 places with local organizing teams. And we're organizing among them. We're beginning the pattern that could be like proto-governance, which is to say it could be a pattern of organizing that could build us toward these bioregional learning centers and these collaborative funding and governance systems organized across Cascadia. And so we're, we're getting close to the end. We have about a week left. I'm on day 25. I think my voice is holding up. We've been having this conversation all across Cascadia, or at least this part of it. Now, when you go out to a larger scale, you'll start to see the real game that we're playing. The real game is this. Oh my gosh, the whole North American continent already organized by watersheds. Isn't that interesting? So convenient. So back in January and February, Penny and I went and did a bioregional activation tour in the greater Takaranto bioregion in southern Ontario, in the Finger Lakes and Genesee River of upstate New York, and in the Cuyahoga River in northeastern Ohio, and we started a conversation about how to regenerate the Great Lakes. That has continued since that time, and they're moving toward a summit that's going to take place in February. But then in May and June, we went from the headwaters of the Colorado River to the Sea of Cortez in Baja, California, planting the seeds for what it would take to regenerate the Colorado. And this led to a landscape leaders retreat about a month ago in one of the headwater communities in Paonia, which is on the western slopes of the Colorado Rockies. This process is unfolding now. And here we are in Cascadia. Are you starting to see the pattern? 
the next one would be this one, which is half of the continental United States. We have people in the Ogallala Aquifer, in the Great Plains, that are starting to talk about organizing. In the Driftless region, in Wisconsin and Minnesota, starting to talk about this. This is how you regenerate a continent. This is how you regenerate a continent. We need to do this for every continent on Earth. We might give Antarctica a pass because there's not much time, but we pick all the rest of the continents. We can regenerate continents by organizing as bioregions and working in parallel across our bioregions, across continents. And this is exactly what we're doing in the Design School for Regenerating Earth, which launched in the beginning of March of this year. You can enroll in the Design School for Regenerating Earth if you like, but I'll let you in on a little secret. You're already part of it. Because it says here, we're gathering to regenerate the Earth at the bioregional scale and organize a planetary network of learning exchanges between landscapes, which is that we're live streaming right now because people in the other bioregions are really excited to learn what's happening in Cascadia. I've got a book about this. You can get a copy in the back and I'll pay for our gas. It's called The Design Pathway for Regenerating Earth. But you're already in its pages because this is the design pathway for regenerating the earth and we are living it into being. We are storying it into being right now. <clears throat> and this leads to Regenerate Cascadia, which is the effort that organized this tour. And I want to invite Claire Atwell and Brandon Letzinger to come up and talk a little about it. Because if it was just us giving a talk, that's cool, yay, and then we're all excited, then what happens? So we need to be able to organize to continue and build this moving forward. So I wanted to invite Brandon and Claire to come up. They're gonna use a microphone that you will not hear anything. And that's because we want the sound to be picked up for the live stream recording so people can see it later. So that's why they're holding this microphone. And I'd love to hand it over to them. All right. So thank you everybody so much for having us here tonight. And maybe before we start, we could have a round of applause for Joe. And that can also be for Joe and Penny. And then we also have Stephen, who has uh, been joining us on this whole tour and at every stop, uh, helping us live stream and connect and all the rest of it. And then maybe also just a round of applause for our local organizers. So Donna and Kay and everybody who helped make this tonight happen. So Joe and Penny are doing a really amazing job with the work that they're doing through the Design School for Regenerating Earth and throughout North America. But our question then really becomes, but what does this mean for here? So what does this mean for with here within the Cascadia bioregion? And more importantly, what does this mean for Gabriola? So, um, yeah, so, Brandon and I uh, met uh, during earlier this year during the Edge Prize, and um, one of the the things that I was thinking about, we had um, Victoria had um, invited Joe and the activation team from the design school to come and do an activation tour of Victoria, and um, we um, during the Edge Prize we were anyway. I noticed that um, the the work that Brandon was doing, that actually if we collaborated and, um, and started to think about how do we hold the, the excitement and, the, and communities coming together, how do we help them connect with the people that are in their region and help them hold those relationships and see them? And um, Brandon's uh, expertise, actually I'd like you to, to sure. go on. Well, Though yeah. we, before we go on, do you want to introduce yourself oh. and your work? <laughs> We're all a little tired. We've been at this for a few weeks. Yes. <laughs> you don't know who I am? This <laughs> <laughs> is a lovely Claire Atwell, community artist and community development expert working from Victoria for multiple years. And say more if you like. You're amazing. <laughs> uh, you know, um, maybe the thing to add to that is just I realized doing this work um, 
I'm all into this work. Like this is the work. And, um, and it's amazing to find another group of people who really see and can hold the integrity of these processes. And what I mean by that is it's very much relationship-based. And, um, and that happens at the grassroots. It happens in the communities. It's where people who, um, who care about their children and, their, and, their, and what, anyway, you know what, I'm going on too much. <laughs> no words. Yeah, and for those of you not familiar with me or my work, uh, my name is Brandon Letzinger, and I'm joining you today from Seattle. Um, and I've probably been involved with uh, Cascadia organizing since 2005. I started an organization called Cascadia Now, uh, which we took up as a 501c3 nonprofit in 2014. Um, I stepped away from that in 2017 um, to take a little bit more of an active stance and be a little bit more involved in certain uh, <clears throat> national politics in the United States and other things, and uh, started another organization called the Department of Bioregion in 2019. And that was a group of us that were really um, focused and engaged and wanted to create a space that could more broadly connect the idea of bioregionalism to Cascadia. Um, and really help share the principles and values of which those ideas are rooted on. And then also to kind of explore the idea um, of what are the other bioregions in the world? Um, who are the other people doing this work? And how can we greater connect and empower with them? So um, when I was able to connect with Claire and uh, Joe uh, earlier this year, uh, obviously it was a really nice uh, natural alignment. Uh, and it's been a really wonderful um, time and project since then. And I'd just like to echo also, I think, what Claire was just touching on, which is one of the big reasons that we decided to partner with Joe and do this tour is that so often when these conversations, especially are talking about a planetary scale and a global scale and a regenerative work and all the rest of it, um, it ends up being entirely disconnected from place. It ends up being abstract or online or, um, and it's not actually connected with the people with boots on the ground um, with the communities most impacted and affected by these choices. And so that became a really important part of this work for us, is how can we actually connect um, the people doing the work and uh, with the resources they need in a way where it's defined by them and, uh, and not outside groups. And so um, within that, we kind of um, started Regenerate Cascadia. And so for us, a big part of this question then became, uh, you know, after talking with Joe and Penny and um, other people is, how do we create the Cascadia bioregion as part of this planetary network? How can we connect in our work and the work that's happening in watersheds all around our region um, into this broader network where we can join this planetary exchange of learning and uh, be sharing the lessons and then also our failures? And then lastly, this leads us to then, how do we grow a core team for this watershed as part of this bioregional network that we're building? How can we connect Gabriola um, with the work happening in Olympia to the work that's happening in the Columbia River, to the work that's happening at the headwaters of the Fraser? How can we greater uh, increase this visibility? And so for us, um, this becomes this essential question of how do we start to connect with the weavers in each community and see them supported. Um, I think a big part of this also becomes how are we working together to create a vision, a shared vision for our region that starts in each place and builds from the grassroots upwards? How do we steward and connect people with a story of place to what's happened here, to how to live appropriately in place? Um, and within that, how do we create an informational commons that's developing these bioregional frameworks in which we can be measuring inputs, outputs, are we being successful? But more than that, what is the regenerative work? So how do we map and connect the regenerative work and, and communities that are most impacted and affected? And how do we visualize that to each other? And what's really exciting about that is once we start to create these regenerative movement maps, we can also see, just as importantly, is what voices are missing and how do we get them into the room? Because that's just as important as who's here right now. And once we start to invite them into conversation and they're in the room, 
then we can start to have the real conversation of how we regenerate our bioregion. And I think what's exciting is that's when we can really truly start to touch on governance. Because that's how do we come together and make decisions together? How do we um, decide on how we do fund different projects? And that kind of leads us to the third and final part of what we're trying to grow with Regenerate Cascadia is how do we begin to start to think about creating a bioregional regeneration fund which can actually work to support the communities and the people most impacted and out there every day doing that work? And how do we create and administer that in a way that's led by those communities at that watershed scale? So how are all those communities and projects coming together, weaving together as a tapestry of, of local projects to co-budget, co-facilitate, co-create? Um, and then lastly, how do we then grow that to then the scale of all the islands in this area? to the entire Salish Sea, and then lastly, kind of upwards to the bioregional and the continental and everything else. So that's some of what we're trying to do, and yeah, I'd love it if you would add. There's not a whole lot more to add to that. I mean, we can carry on, but... Um, uh, well, maybe I just mentioned one thing. They're gonna have an online co uh, conference, November 3rd through 12th, which is sort of the capstone of this. Like, we're just weaving through very quickly like, we're here for one day. Hi, everyone. <laughs> See you all later. Tomorrow I'm going to go play with my daughter. Yes. Um, and the idea is this is a way of creating parallel conversations. And so the, the summit, which you can find at regeneratecascadia.org, November 3rd through 12th, is going to be a place of beginning to hold these conversations as we move forward <coughs> so that we can start to share the stories of what we're seeing. And I'll just give an example. When we were in Olympia, Olympia is at the southernmost end of the Salish Sea. And the Deschutes River comes in there. And there's a dam that some idiot thought they'd put so they could have a reflecting pool to take pictures of the Capitol building for the Capitol of Washington. And there's this really unhealthy lake. So for about 20 years, local people in the community have been fighting to get this changed. And now they have 180 million US dollars to remove the dam and do an estuary restoration, which is incredible. So we're hearing stories like this as we're moving through Cascadia, and we want to be able to share these stories with each other. And so this summit is a first opportunity to share some of these stories. So just to give you a flavor of what happens when, when we're traveling through, we're like seeing a bunch of cool stuff, and then we need to make this visible to everyone. And we're just touching the surface yeah. with the pace that we're moving through. And Joe brings up a good point that we're terrible at actually uh, remembering to plug our, our thing or like the next step. So, um, yeah. So as he said, uh, yeah, we have this upcoming bioregional summit. It'll be November 3rd through November 12th. The first weekend will be all presentations and discussions uh, from the community. As we've been traveling, we've been connecting with really amazing people. If you're in the audience, you're probably doing amazing work. And uh, we want to give people an opportunity to share among themselves. Um, more th and then during the week, we'll actually be inviting the different watershed organizers to give report backs, um, how the experience was, but also different inspirational projects, as well as maybe needs or challenges that they're having, um, and then maybe different uh, next steps that they've identified. And then the last weekend will be really an open space um, format to come together and really envision what we'd like to do next. And as Joe touched on, this is because we're, we are. We're only in these communities for one or two days, three or four if we're really lucky. Um, and we want this to be the start of a conversation, not the end. And a big part of this project is we're not coming with solutions and answers. We're coming with questions. And we firmly believe that from what we've seen that, that the work is happening in our communities right now. And so a big part of this is just trying to connect each other together, connect our work together, um, and do all the rest. And I think the exciting part about that is that everything that we're doing, we're creating templates and it is replicable. These teams in the Colorado River and Great Lakes are watching what we're doing and everything that we're trying to do is so that it can be easily done again. Yeah, so, um, yeah, these are creating really compelling stories and, um, and with really compelling stories, People want to be part of that, and one of the ways that we need is is actually putting budgets together so that we can actually put um, attract the funding that's going to be required to do some of this work. So, yeah. And with that, I'll just end that if you're not familiar with Cascadia or bioregionalism, this idea goes back almost well. Bioregionalism goes back more than 40 years. 
for decades, people have been doing this work and living here and are a part of the communities and doing all of this. Um, for Cascadia, this movement really began in Olympia in 1986 at the first ever Cascadia Bioregional Congress um, held at Evergreen University. And, oh, there we go. Get the inspiration. <laughs> so this idea. <laughs> You're good, man. Keep rolling. <laughs> um, so 40 years ago, more than 150 people gathered at Evergreen University in Olympia, Washington, to start to challenge and ask themselves, what would it look like if we stepped up to take responsibility for the places that we lived? What would it look like if we took responsibilities for our home and our watersheds? And now, after nearly 40 years, we're just here asking you the same questions. What would it look like if we stepped up to take care of our watersheds and our homes? What would it look like to regenerate Gabriola? And what would it look like to regenerate the Cascadia bioregion? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. So, so, so we'd love to open it up for any questions and discussion. Um, and also to invite you to sign up to join Regenerate Cascadia to get updates about what's happening at the larger scale. And to also say that, as you can see, we're not just trying to have a conversation once. We're actually, oh, that was interesting, wasn't it? What did I decide to do that for? Strange, oh well. Um, is that we're actually trying to build a capacity for conversations and organizing and mobilizing resources and capacity because there is no time to waste. So I'd love to just open up for any questions or comments that anyone might have.